Now, you know, there are a number of archaeologists, no matter what you do, even if it's something really great, you always are going to have naysayers. And I have my share of naysayers, too. And if they heard that Raiders of the Lost Ark music, they would be wagging their fingers and saying, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to be Indiana Jones. It's not politically correct. But you know what? It's what sells the adventure of archaeology, so I don't care. Anyway, I have to hook up my laptop um, wherever the cables are. And, and actually, uh, yeah, they're down here somewhere. Here's one of them. Oh, <laughs> what happened to the audio? Here we go. <laughs> no, you got to do the audio first. Yeah. yeah so, no, we're on that side. <laughs> How many geeks does it take, right? Right. That's it. Thank you very much. All right, we're getting there. Anyway, I don't need that. Um, let me just get this going here. Okay. It's a long story. It's a big story. I've been at this for 22 years, since 1994. And prior to that, I was just a regular guy. Um, never thought I'd ever do anything like this in my life. And the whole project just snowballed. One thing led to another, to another, to another. I kept on thinking I would be finished. And it's still going. In fact, there's a lot going on right now, and I've sort of become a political operative of sorts down in Central America trying to reshape the direction of Honduras. And I have to say they, for some reason, are actually listening to me, and their president actually parrots back what I've been telling him for a couple of years. So who knows where it's going to lead. Hopefully he stays in power. Hopefully I stay around. Anyway, um, I don't know how many of you know anything about this story. So I thought I would start out with just a short video clip that will give you a little bit of a background. And all I have to do is get my uh, PowerPoint here to work correctly. And I think this is it. Here we go. Oh, okay, we got that one. You don't need to see the logo. Okay. We're a very experienced group. I don't think there's anybody here that really needs to be reminded, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's very easy in open areas, on the phone, talking amongst ourselves, to disclose what we're here doing. Just try and refrain from it, because what we don't want to do is raise our profile any more than we are right now. Purely because of what we're here to do. At the moment, it's relatively discreet. We want to make sure that from the word go is that we have a proper security solution going on which allows all the subject matter experts to concentrate on what they're here to do. This is clearing throughout here. Yeah, right here. Yeah, that's it. We're trying to find something that everyone's been looking for for a long time. It isn't just a ruin. It's part of the national psyche. The legend of the lost city is part of the culture. Everybody has wanted to find it for over 500 years. Many, many people know about the legend of the White City. I can remember clearly my mom telling me stories as a child about uh, probably Mayan city in the middle of the jungle. When I was growing up, they would say they built this huge city and they just started disappearing. So everyone wants to know what really happened to them. Here we have thousands of square miles of the most impenetrable jungle that apparently has never seen any kind of exploration, has not seen human beings, at least for centuries. And now we have the tools through LiDAR, through this very high technology, to see what's on the ground for the first time. It doesn't seem as though there has been any habitation or visits. It's been intact for a very long time. What we are doing is genuine modern day discovery. Got a track through the back there. Excuse me, Doug. Oscar. What? There are inscriptions right here. There are? Yes. Yeah, wow, that's it. Wow, wow, wow. Look at the one that I have. It's a place where they have a place. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody stop. Back up. Don't touch anything. Don't clear anything, please. Wow. 
there was no real distinction between the scientists and the layman. The scientists were as excited and surprised. Every day we keep finding new things and the eyes seem to get clearer. It's completely unambiguous. Those are ruins. And now the question is how old are they? Who built them? Uh, what are they made from? You know, but they're definitely uh, ruins. Okay, anyway, that gives you a little bit of a background. Um, and I have to correct Doug. It's actually, the legend is the legend of Ciudad Blanca, which in English means white city. It actually, the city has two names, Ciudad Blanca and Lost City of the Monkey God. The two legends were that the buildings in the city were made out of white stone, hence Ciudad Blanca, white city. And they also allegedly worshiped the giant monkey god statue, kind of like a King Kong, which uh, is kind of believable because many um, groups throughout the world in earlier times did worship different animal figures and monkeys are pretty popular in the tropics. So it's possible. Anyway, as you can see in the beginning there, we had a lot of soldiers. Honduras, as many of you probably know, is a country that's uh, had a lot of problems, particularly recently. And it's not the safest place to go to, although it's improving quite a bit. The government of Honduras was very happy that we were doing this, and they supplied us with this crack special forces team. As you can see, they look like they were ready to go uh, attack Fallujah or something. So wherever we went, we had this whole armada with us, and uh, we were definitely very safe. Um, however, one problem was that when we uh, wanted to go to the jungle, we, had to go, we could only go in by helicopter. And at first, the Hondurans offered me the services of their helicopters, the military helicopters. And I went to meet with their defense minister and their uh, various government officials, and they said, great, you can use our helicopters, but you have to pay for them to get fixed so they are flyable. <laughs> and that, uh, that made me think quite a bit. And uh, in the end, we wound up bringing in our own helicopter from a friend of mine who owns helicopters in San Diego. And actually, I believe in the back of the room is the pilot who flew the helicopter all the way from Honduras to the, from San Diego to the jungle, along with a crack mechanic and our spare parts. So we knew we had at least one helicopter that we could depend on. In the end, the Honduran helicopters worked most of the time, and I tried to put other people that weren't on my staff on those helicopters. <laughs> As I'm sure your trial lawyers, you can understand the liability in this project was in another universe. You know, we were very fortunate. Anyway, um, for those of you that don't know your geography, this is a map of Central America and you can see where Honduras is. And the area we searched is called the Mesquitia Jungle, which is approximately the eastern third of the country. This area by acts of history, and just the fact that the terrain is like this. It goes up and down and it's got one of the thickest, most treacherous jungles in the world. It's 50 meter canopy, that's 150 feet tall for those of you that don't know the metric system. And it's multi-level. Basically you can't see Jack. You know, I couldn't, it's kind of like looking at the audience now. I can't see you because I'm blinded by the lights. But in the jungle you can't see more than 20 or 30 feet at, at most. So you have no idea where you're going. Um, another thing that Doug didn't mention was that a lot of these people that went in looking to try and find it over the years didn't come back. Or maybe you did mention that, but I don't, I don't think you did. So it made, it's a very dangerous place. And in fact, this map is from the mid 19th century, which my wife, who's sitting in the back of the room, happened to have bought for me on a trip here a number of years ago. There used to be a map store in the arcade. And it so shows the Mesquitia jungle, and in the area that is outlined in red, it says Portal de Inferno. I can't roll my eyes very well, meaning gates of hell. This is what this area was considered, the gates of hell. From an airplane, it looks like this. I refer to it as the crown of a piece of broccoli. So if you're at the grocery store and you look at the broccoli head, that's like looking out the airplane at the jungle. It's solid green, and that's 150 feet of multi-level canopy. No breaks. When you're on the ground, this is how you have to get around. This is uh, one of our head camp masters, actually the former master jungle warfare instructor for the British SAS. We hired a few of those folks to 
try and help make sure that we made it back out. Uh, hacking away through the jungle. As you, as you can see, you can't see very far and it's very slow going. In fact, most jungle expeditions in this type of an area, if you can do a mile a day, you're doing really well. Another way to get around in the jungle is uh, you have to cross these mud holes and almost like quick mud. And as you can see here, we are having a difficult time. An easier option, but it doesn't always get you where you want to go, is walking in a river. As you can see in this picture, we're walking and we're having a good time. However, we might walk 10 feet and all of a sudden the, it becomes 20 feet deep and then we all fall into water and then we got to swim out, only go into a shallow again. It's very, very tough. The last option is using a cayuca or a dugout canoe, which is great as long as the water is deep enough for the canoe. And as you can see here, what happens is you're pushing it, then all of a sudden you run into a shallow and you got this one ton canoe that you have to somehow move. My first trip in Honduras looking for the lost city was in 1994. I spent about three weeks with a group of 18 well, hacking our way through the jungle old school style like Indiana Jones with the machetes or like the guy you saw before. Um, it was the blind leading the blind. We never found a city, but we found a lot of really interesting artifacts. Now, after three weeks of the jungle, here's a picture of myself in the back center kind of leaning over this way after a few weeks of trying to make it through the jungle. It was extremely exhausting. Now, during this time, I had an epiphany moment. We were up in the highland areas, far away from any human habitation, and we came upon this boulder on a stream. By the way, that's me in 1994. I looked a little younger. Um, and we saw this carving, which we outlined in chalk. And to all of us, and the archaeologists with us, this is some kind of a shaman or a man with a very fancy headdress, kind of looked maybe Mayan, but there weren't supposed to be any Mayan people here. He's got what maybe is a digging stick and a gourd with maybe seeds coming out the back. It's all just guesswork. But I saw it and said, why is there a carving of this type, which is, seems to be promoting agriculture, agriculture, in the middle of a rainforest far from where there's any people, and there's just no way they're doing agriculture here. Going back to my paleo climate research, I went, oh, I know that the world is always changing. Climate is very dynamic. And even though now we're going through a period of rapid climate change, this is not so unusual over geologic time. Things are always changing. So perhaps 1,000 or 2,000 years ago, this rainforest wasn't exactly the rainforest as it is today. And that made me think, you know, there might be something to this legend. There really might be a place out here that no one has been able to get to because it's too difficult to explore. And the environment was different, and it could have supported a large civilization. So many years later, and several trips later, um, there's a technology called LIDAR, which Doug had explained. And it was originally uh, invented to help navigation in the space program in the 60s. But it evolved in the early 2000s into being a mapping program. It is now all the rage everywhere around the world. They're ma remapping the world using airborne LIDAR. The cool thing about it is that it maps the surface of the Earth in 3D. And I'm going to give you, a, show you an example so you'll understand it. So each point, each pixel, each dot in that image has an X, Y, and Z coordinate and allows you to see everything and manipulate the image so you can actually walk through it or fly through it or whatever you want to do. In addition, it's the only technology, far better than radar or sonar or anything else, that allows you to erase the vegetation in the jungle and see what's actually on the ground. If you're in open areas, you can get a resolution of two centimeters, which is less than an inch. And in areas like where we went, we got about 18 inches. But this was unheard of. When I heard about this technology, I went, this is the only way you can effectively search a jungle area. The old way of walking through the jungle aimlessly is for the birds. I mean, I never wanted to do that again. So fortunately for me, the newly elected president in 2010 um, ran into a friend of mine in Honduras, and he called me up, strangely enough, on a Sunday from church. I mean, just an outlier, and said, oh, I hear you once lo went looking for Silla de Blanca. Would you be interested in looking for it again? Our country is really screwed up, and I need something that uh, my population could put their arms around and feel proud about. And I said, well, that's great. If you uh, send me a letter with your name and my name on it on official letterhead, I'll see if I can raise the money and do it. 
And I had just read about this LIDAR technology and I thought, ah, if I can get the president behind me and I can get someone who can do this LIDAR, this will be a doable project. Well, after a while I did, I found a partner who uh, was fool enough to believe in my idea and he helped finance it and there we were in 2012. We went to Honduras, we had this rickety old airplane uh, with this million dollar LIDAR unit in it and we scanned the jungle. It was really great because we stayed at a, a beautiful resort on the Isle of Roatan with a blue lagoon and the pilot and the engineer, they had to go out every day for eight hours in this little old plane with no air conditioning and bad brakes and fly a grid pattern over the jungle every day, come back, process the data in the uh, little condo on the Blue Lagoon, which we're doing right here, and looking to see if we find anything. Well, on the third day, guess what happened? We found something. And when the engineers came and told me, that's what, that was my expression. I was quite excited. I felt vindicated after all these years after my wife telling me she never wanted to hear the word Honduras or Lost City again, and after everyone telling me, this is Fulton's folly, you're crazy, it's never gonna happen, boom, we found something. And this is what it looked like. This is how LIDAR sees the jungle. All right, we put false colors in there, the green are the trees, the blue is a little river. All right, and the shading, the shading in the green is el different elevations. And this kind of was what it would look like to your eye. You, know, you look at it and you go, okay, I see a bunch of green, I see a blue, yeah, I, I can tell it's a, some water way, but you have no idea there's a city hidden there. Well, through the magic of LIDAR, you push the button and this is what happens. Boom. The vegetation goes away and it's like looking at the moon. Now, to most of you, you're going to look at it and go, so what? I don't see anything in there. But if you look carefully on the top side of that river valley, you'll see some squares or rectangles and some geometric shapes. Well, these are actually um, the outlines of buildings. And to make it a little easier for you, I've highlighted some of them in this pink. And you can see where they're at. There's a Z-shaped building on the, down, on the uh, bottom part of the river. And on top of it, there's a big rectangle that's about the size of a football field. There's a bunch of longitudinal mounds. These are all foundations for bigger structures. There's even a pyramid in there, but I'm not gonna try and show you that one. It's a little bit hard for you to figure out if you're not used to using it, but it happens to be just to the right of that football size field, that big square. Anyway, there are dozens of these features all over the place. So we knew, according to the archeologists, that we found a city. This area turned out to be two and a half miles long by about a half mile wide. Now, one of the things you can do with LIDAR to show you how it works, is we created this animation from the data from the city. If we wanted to explore one of those mounds a little bit better, we put it in the computer and we make this little movie and watch what happens. We can rotate the image. Even though we took the image from flying above, it's in 360 degrees. So we can see all the leaves and trees, lift the trees off, and you can see the foundations for this big plaza, which in a moment will tilt towards you and you can see it a little better. There you go. Then we put the trees back on and you can see you can't see a darn thing. So the next question is, we found, we found two of these places. Now, are they the place of legend? We have to figure that out. Well, we don't know unless we go there. Well, how are we gonna get there? There are no roads, it's dangerous. The only way in is gonna be by helicopter as I stated earlier. So we came up with a plan. It took us three years to get the money, to get the politics done, and to get to figure out the logistics. We were prepared to actually uh, rappel out of the helicopter to go through the trees so we could get in there. But fortunately, I was looking at the LIDAR data and I realized that you could take that same data and look at it, look at, oops, we weren't supposed to see that one yet. Look at it as though you were standing on the ground. So this is that same data and we're looking first at a bird's eye view on the left and then as though we're standing right on the ground looking straight in front of you of a clearing, a natural clearing in a river. Well, this natural clearing happened to be right smack dab in the middle of our target city. And I went, I wonder if we can put a helicopter in there. So I met with our pilot who's sitting in the back miles and with the Honduran military 
the Air Force people and said, look, I think we can do this. We can measure the distance between the trees and the leaves and we can tell how, much, how tall the vegetation is on the ground. Can we put a chopper in there? The Honduran military had big clunky old Huey said, no way, you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta park these things 20 miles away and hike in. And I said, well, no way, that's not gonna work. We might as well just give up. Miles, who's in the back there, said, I can put my helicopter in there, no problem. And that's what we did. The Hondurans saw that and they said, where can we get that technology? So now they're all about, let's get light iron, let's, we can put our choppers anywhere now. This next picture shows exactly what that scene looked like in our first touchdown. This is when Miles and I were first flying to that spot that I just showed you. It doesn't look all that bad in this picture, but trust me, it's uh, a lot of things in there. This is uh, some of the fancy flying that Miles had to do to get in there. The Honduran pilots often had a very kind of bizarre sense of humor. <laughs> in fact, Miles and a couple of us were in the helicopter that Miles was flying in our first foray and we're hovering above the little mil uh, remote military airstrip outside the jungle waiting for the Honduran military to load up their old Huey and take, we had National Geographic go with us and we put them in that helicopter and said, okay, we're waiting for them and we're, wait, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're watching their helicopter attempt to take off and it starts pitching and yawing and rocking every which way. And I look at Miles and I go, I don't think this is right. And he says, yeah, I don't think it's right either. <laughs> and finally they got off and they started following us and then we looked back and they're gone and went, oh God. This is it, we're finished now. The chopper went down. Well, fortunately, the pilot, his stabilizer circuits were not working right. He was smart enough to go back and they aborted and they had a, we had to wait a day for another helicopter. Anyway, these are the trials and tribulations of modern day adventuring. Well, once we got to the site, we set up camp and this was our luxurious uh, common area where we would dine. And as you can see, it was rather muddy. It rained all the time. I guess that's why they call it a rainforest. Um, so we were just wet. This was my, uh, my home for a couple weeks. Doesn't look so bad in the picture. It actually really wasn't that bad. It was pretty good sleeping. The only problem is it was moldy and wet and we all basically had two sets of clothes. We had a dirty set of wet clothes and a clean set of wet clothes. And the only difference was at the end of the day, you would take your dirty set of clothes and put them outside and let the rain all night clean them. A couple of the other uh, little dangers out there were, were snakes. Um, this, sna this area has the fear de lance, which is the deadliest snake in the Americas. On the first night out, there was a six and a half foot one that one of the guys was about to step out over his, um, out of his uh, hammock, and just as he was about to put his foot down, there's a coiled up fear de lance ready to strike. And he screamed, and Woody, who's the guy holding the snake there, was the British SAS guy, came by and got him with his knife. And the snake spread venom all over the place, which is a digestive enzyme, and it started to dissolve his arm. It was a big mess. But everybody survived. This next picture you can see, these, this is the business end of a fair to lance, the longest fangs in the West, inch and a quarter. Now, one of the other dangers, more insidious than all of them, are protozoan parasites. Uh, we all got a million bug bites, and they all look like this at first. This is someone's knee with a bug bite. This looks like a mosquito bite. Six weeks later, this is what it looks like. I know this is right before lunch, but uh, okay. You're used to looking at this stuff. So it's called leishmaniasis. It's the scourge, scourge of the tropical world, and actually it's uh, spreading even to the United States now. It's endemic in Texas and Oklahoma due to global warming. It's a nasty, nasty parasite. There is, there is no real true cure and there is no vaccine. Um, half of our group, 23 people, got it and are all being treated by the NIH and Bethesda. So it was a good way to see our tax dollars being spent. Um, in the jungle, once we were there, we had to know how to get to the different sites, the different buildings. So here's our chief archeologist. He's actually standing in the middle of a city, looking at a pyramid, you'd have no idea. But we had that LIDAR data mounted in the GPS unit handheld with a map on it. 
And it was just like your, with your iPhones, it would tell you to go 100 meters this way, here's this building, make a left, 50 meters that way is another building. It's the greatest way to navigate. I mean, this is the way we upended archaeology by doing this. This is the way it's done. Here's one of another archaeologist in the middle of the city. And we have a, another LIDAR unit where you can see over on the lower uh, right where some of the objects are starting to come out of the ground and we're clearing it and we can see things. We wound up finding initially 52 beautiful carved stone objects. This is a bowl made out of pure basalt, which is like granite, hand carved. They didn't have power tools in those days. It created such excitement in Honduras that the president, the man in the straw hat and the white shirt, came out with his entourage to check everything out. And now it's a major archaeological site, which is, we just actually had a team there in January for a month, a joint Honduran-American team, excavating things, and we're now up to 241 beautiful stone sculptures and so on. This is what it looks like when they're first starting the excavation. This is just an 18-square-meter 18 18 meter area. So all these objects just came out of a little tiny area. So you can imagine what's in the entire city. The president... Um, was very happy about it, and here I am with him, an archaeologist and the Minister of Science and Technology, extracting one of the first bowls. And this is what uh, some of these bowls look like. They're quite exquisite. Um, going back to the legend of the lost city and so on, um, this object here was one of the first things we saw, and I was thinking, okay, when I first saw it, this is a monkey, until I noticed the ears were on top of its head and not on the side. And I, Okay, it's a jaguar. So now we're calling it the city of the jaguar. Probably to me the most important thing we found were these glyphs or hieroglyphics, whatever you want to call them, emojis, on some of the sculptures. So this, I mean, think about it. An emoji, a hieroglyphic, a glyph, it's just a pictograph. Each one of these symbols represents a thought or an idea. An idea. It's the same thing. Well, the archaeologists can't figure this out yet, and this is a big deal. We found more of these, and I think it's going to tell a heck of a story hopefully while well, I'm still around. Anyway, the, uh, the country is really behind this. They see this as a keystone in their way to try and promote their image in the world. They're very proud of their cultural patrimony, and in addition, they're very proud of their natural patrimony. Honduras has much to offer, even though it's still a screwed up country, but the new administration is trying very hard. They've taken our project, and they created this logo. Instead of calling it Sierra Blanca, now they call it Caja Camasa, which is the indigenous word meaning Sierra Blanca. And they're, they're doing their best. The president has ordered the military to clear the rainforest of all squatters, narco traffickers, and everything else. And they're actually really doing it. And in fact, have a brigade. And the hats say, Protección de Ecosistema, protectors of the ecosystem. This is unheard of in Latin America. This is a big deal. One of the things we noticed is the rainforest, as Doug mentioned, is rapidly being depleted from narco traffickers paying poor campesinos to go in there, clear out the mahogany logs, sell them, and then put in cattle and sell them to the uh, fast food industry here. We thought the only way to stop that and to get the political will was to promote it in the media, which we did through National Geographic and other media outlets. They have trees, as you can see in this image, that are incredible. They're like our redwoods. They're hundreds, centuries old. When we were flying on our way to the Lost City area, we would see sites like this. And this is growing like a cancer. And we figured if we didn't do something in 10 or 15 years, this jungle is gone. Um, there's other areas that, say, 10 years ago, this was complete jungle. And now it looks like uh, Kansas. I don't know. It's terrible. So I'm going to leave you with one last thought. I know I'm about out of time, and you're all very hungry. This is uh, a video that our ethnobotanist made who's uh, from Harvard, his name is Mark Plotkin. He's doing a lot of work in the Amazon, but it's applicable to every rainforest and every natural patrimony area in the world. It's only two minutes long, but I think it's worth your while to listen to. I have had people say to me several times recently, well, the Amazon, you know, that's so 1980s. <laughs> When I got into this business in the 70s, people would say, who cares about the Amazon? We have to worry about population growth. So now when people say to me, who cares about the Amazon? We have to worry about global warming, climate change. Well, guess what? It's all the same thing. Overpopulation drives environmental destruction, which drives climate change. The first 
essentially global report of climate change was 25 years ago, the Kogi Indians of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in northern Colombia said, hey, what are you knuckleheads doing down there? Our glaciers are melting. And everybody thought, ha, 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 it's thank you. Look at those funny little white hats. But that was a report that the climate was changing. We didn't listen, and, and we failed to listen at our peril. People need to be interested because, look, whether you're interested in changing climate, whether you're interested in too many poor people, or whether you're interested in drug-resistant bacteria, which is a much greater threat to our species than climate change, deforestation, terrorism, nuclear weapons, you have an interest in the greatest expression of life on Earth, which is the rainforest, which is home to most of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. And if you look at the record, 80% of our antibiotics come from nature. And as a student of history, I know that history often predicts the future. So where are the best antibiotics waiting for us in the rainforest of today? All right, I thank you for your interest. And I'd be happy to answer any questions during the day.